Labor is the process by which babies are physiologically delivered, more formally defined as the process by which regular uterine contractions cause progressive cervical dilation and effacement, resulting in the expulsion of the fetus and other products of conception. It is divided into three main stages, and some early signs that labour is beginning include the bloody show, which is a small amount of blood mixed with mucus that is discharged from the cervix, and this may precede labour by as much as 72 hours. Waters breaking, also known as rupture of membranes, can occur before labour begins, termed premature rupture of membranes, though if this occurs at 37 weeks of gestation or later, 80-90% to of these cases will begin labour within 24 hours. Labour typically begins between 37 and 42 weeks of gestation. The first stage is divided into two parts, lasting from the onset of labour to the cervix reaching 10 cm dilated. First is the latent phase, where contractions are irregular but become regular, featuring mild discomfort as the cervix dilates to around 4 to 6 cm. The mean in nulli paris mothers is around 8 hours, while this is around 4.5 in multi paris mothers. The contractions pull on the thicker cervical tissues, causing them to dilate, as well as to become thinner, called effacement. Initially, these contractions occur every 5 to 30 minutes, lasting 30 seconds, before then lasting 60 seconds every 3 to 5 minutes. There is an example of a positive feedback loop here, with cervical stretching causing the release of oxytocin from the posterior pituitary, which stimulates uterine contraction, which in turn leads to more cervical stretching. There is also release of prostaglandins from the placenta that facilitate the uterine contractions. The second part of the first stage is the active phase, featuring rapid dilation from 4 to 6 cm to 10 cm, which is considered fully dilated. The contractions here are typically intense and happen every 30 seconds and last 60 to 120 seconds, meaning they can overlap. The second stage spans from full dilation to delivery of the fetus. This typically lasts just under an hour in nulli paris mothers and around 20 minutes in multi paris. In this stage, the mother supplements the uterine contractions by bearing down, something that should be discouraged in the first stage until the cervix is fully dilated, as it could cause tearing of the cervix. This stage is considered arrested when it lasts beyond 3 hours and 2 hours respectively for nulli and multi paris mothers. The third stage begins after delivery of the fetus, and ends with the delivery of the placenta. It typically involves the uterus contracting to expel the placenta, and is a short duration of typically a few minutes, but can last as long as 30 minutes. In some cases, oxytocin can be given immediately after the fetus is delivered, which helps continue uterine contractions, and reduce the risk of the main complication in this phase, which is postpartum hemorrhage, usually as a result of uterine atony. If delivery of the placenta is delayed, it may signal another potential complication, placenta accreta, which is an abnormally adherent placenta, where the villi are attached to the myometrium rather than stopping just before it, at the nitabuclea. This can be found via ultrasound prior to delivery at roughly 20 to 24 weeks gestation, and is often treated with caesarean hysterectomy. The time from delivery of the placenta to 4 hours afterwards is sometimes called the fourth stage of labour, as it is the window in which most complications occur. During this time, mother and baby can bond, assuming both are healthy, including initiation of breastfeeding. The mother should be monitored for bleeding, blood pressure, as well as general well-being. This completes the stages of labour, 
However, we'll also cover the cardinal movements of labour, which are the movements and positions undertaken by the fetus in order to facilitate its delivery. Multiple factors also affect successful delivery, and these are commonly referred to as the three P's. Power, this is the uterine contraction and maternal efforts. Second is passenger, which refers to the fetus and related factors, such as the presentation, which refers to which part of the fetus is leading the way, which is normally the head, termed cephalic. But if it is the feet or legs, then this is a breech presentation. In this case, manoeuvres like external cephalic version, where the fetus is turned, can be done, but many go on to have a caesarean section. Position, this is generally the direction in which the fetus is facing. Lie, which is the angle at which the fetus lies. For example, the typical is a longitudinal lie where the maternal and fetal spines are parallel, compared to a horizontal lie in which the fetus's spine is transverse to the mother's or somewhere in between, termed oblique. The number of fetuses is also a factor. The third P is passage. This refers to the maternal anatomy, for example the diameter of the maternal pelvis or presence of a structural abnormality such as fibroids. The first cardinal movement of labour is descent, where the fetus descends into the pelvis, mostly happening simultaneously along with engagement, which is when the largest diameter of the fetal head descends into the maternal pelvis. These can happen before the onset of true labour, but will generally feature throughout stages 1 and 2. Flexion is next, where uterine contractions exert pressure down the fetal spine, particularly towards the occiput, the back of the skull, causing flexion of the fetal neck as it enters the pelvic inlet. This encourages the chin to flex towards the chest. This generates the suboccipitobrigmatic diameter, which is the smallest diameter position at an average of around 9.5 centimetres. Next is internal rotation. The shape of the pelvic floor encourages rotation as the fetus passes through the pelvis. Initially, during descent and flexion, the fetus is positioned so that the occiput is facing either left or right, but as it passes through, it completes a 90 degree rotation so that typically it is facing anteriorly which allows the shoulders to align with the transverse diameter of the pelvis. This stage is typically complete by the start of the second stage of labour. Next is crowning. Once the widest diameter of the fetal head has passed the narrowest part of the maternal pelvis, the fetus is said to be crowning and is visible at the vulva. Then we have extension of the presenting part. As the fetus progresses, once it passes beneath the suprapubic arch, this allows for its neck to extend and will typically be facing the maternal posterior. Then comes external rotation and restitution. At this stage, the shoulders of the fetus will be reaching the pelvic floor, and as they pass the pelvic outlet, the head may be seen to rotate externally to face the left or right medial thigh of the mother. The realignment of the head and the shoulders is called restitution. Then we have expulsion. As the anterior shoulder presents, in cases with a healthcare provider present, gentle downward traction can help the anterior shoulder slip under the suprapubic arch, followed then by upward traction to help the posterior shoulder be delivered, as well as the rest of the body. This marks the end of the second stage of labour. Shoulder dystocia is a complication considered an emergency as it can lead to fetal death, where the fetal head delivers but the anterior shoulder is impacted behind the pubic symphysis or the posterior shoulder is impacted by the sacral promontory.